Good afternoon and welcome back to the second session of the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities Afrofuturism Conference. Uh, my name is Scott French. I am an Associate Professor of History at the University of Central Florida and Associate Director of the Center for Humanities and Digital Research. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our afternoon speaker, uh, Dr. Tanisha Taylor. Um, Dr. Taylor received her PhD in Communication Studies from Bowling Green State University. Her primary research agenda focuses on African-American oral and rhetorical history and digital humanities, a subject uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, her most recent publications on Afrofuturism include We Speak, We Make, We Tinker, Afrofuturism as Applied Digital Humanities in the Black Speculative Arts, Speculative Arts Movement, Afrofuturism, Art and Design, edited by Ronaldo Anderson and Clint Fluker. Uh, she also authored a review of Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro-Blackness, edited by Ronaldo Anderson and Charles Earl Jones. And her other uh, published works include Pedagogies of Race, Di Digital Humanities in the Age of Ferguson with Amy Earhart in Debates in Digital Humanities 2016. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. And uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, welcome to everyone who has joined us for this conversation today. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to do a couple of uh, sort of housekeeping things and say this. I talk with my hands, so I'm going to be doing this a lot. <laughs> uh, but also uh, to say that if I start to talk too fast, uh, somebody just scream at me and tell me to slow down. <laughs> I get excited about these things. So today, the title of my talk, which I would like to thank uh, a colleague and friend, uh, the future Dr. Goylan Williams for, for this. Uh, the title of my talk today is Mock to Death by Time, Zora Neale Hurston as the Sound of Afrofuture Present Past to Future Past. So in reading and uh, preparing for this talk today, I went back and I read uh, Zora Neale Hurston's uh, Dust Tracks on the Road, which I had not read in quite some years, <laughs> admittingly. I think I read it in graduate school once, and that might have been it. And what I realized in reading through that text again is that uh, it's one of the most probably amazing pieces of what I would call critical autoethnography that I think I've ever read. Trained as an anthropologist, uh, Hurston was clearly familiar with not just what was starting to become a more burgeoning academic field of ethnography, but was herself designing the field of critical autoethnography in a way that is gone under appreciated or frankly, probably not really appreciated at all as I don't think any of us really think of her in those terms and we obviously should. So part of my talk today is going to be an advocation of Zora Neale Hurston as a critical autoethnographer and what it means for us to be able to think about her, particularly in those terms for uh, the fields of communication, sociology, the field of Afrofuturism, the field of digital humanities. So in looking at Hurston, I've always looked at Zora Neale Hurston as a time traveler, that she gives us a way to not just look into the future, but to look into the future past. She gives us a way to think through what the culture and language and positionality can look like if we're willing to come up in close and stand in space and in closeness in proximity with Black folks and the folks of our local space. 
to not just look for or look at cultural producers and sort of those elites that we consider as cultural producers, but really to look at just the regular folk, at people. And the way that folk, that people interact with through and in cultural production every day. How does it look? How does it feel? How does it smell? What does it taste like, right? Where does it linger in our presence? And when we say it, what is it, right? Is it food? Is it sound? Is it music? Is it the giggles of little children? What is it? Is it the embrace of an intimate? What are we looking at that produces culture? What are we looking at that produces text? What are the experiences that produce for us the ability to create that viral tweet? I like to think of Zora Neale Hurston and how quotable she was and is as a scholar, as a playwright, as a screenwriter, as a thinker. I think that she would have been fire on Twitter, honey. That would have been the best thing ever. <laughs> Zora, can you imagine Zora Neale Hurston with a Twitter account? <sighs> My little heart, right? But this is a way that we can think about the way that we understand the future past. And so the way that I think about the future past is to look at the ways that we manifest the past in the future, the way that we manifest the future in the past. In Dust Tracks on the Road, Zora Neale Hurston talks about the way that folk participate in their cultures and in their cultural surroundings. And she makes an argument for the idea that particularly for the Black folks that she was interviewing, that those folks saw themselves as being cut off to some extent of mainstream culture, but also intimately involved in it. And that the way that they understood themselves as human was something that was aligned to what they looked for in their future. Whether that was a collective future of the way that they wanted to see their culture progress or whether that was an individual future of what they wanted to gain from their cultural performance. So what does that mean for us now? I think that one of the things that it means for us now is that we need to look at the ways that, particularly when we're thinking about Afrofuturism, we need to think about the ways that we produce culture, that we replicate culture, that we push culture forward into the future. When I make the argument for future past, I'm making the argument that what we're really looking at is the ways that we bring the past with us into our future, but also the ways in which the future has already passed us by. So when we think about how we understand the way that the future functions, we often think about it in terms of planning. And this is where I deal with the quote, mock to death by time. Here, what I'm looking at are what are the ways that we come to understand our future in the way that time mocks us, right? Because time doesn't wait and time doesn't care. Time, frankly, is the pits. Time is rude. I mean, hella rude. Like F-bomb rude. Time will walk up to you and be like, oh, you're cute. And then walk away from you like, I guess, right? One of the things that I love about the way that we understand Zora Neale Hurston is that she gave us a language as both members of culture, but also as academics, as scholars, right? to be able to bring a moment like that moment I just brought to you and say, not only is that a culturally authentic moment, that is an academically authentic moment. We are allowed 
to be fully human. But we don't wait for allowance. We come into this space and we perform in ways that allows us to create knowledge from the centralized space that we take up. Because time will mock you to your grave if you don't take time seriously. Hurston theorized that for Black folks especially, what this meant was always taking up space, always taking up time. And the intentionality of the way in which that functions. So that quote about being mocked to death by time is one that I wanna take a moment to read the full length of for you because there's something really, really beautiful in the way that it presents. And I quote, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever in the same horizon, never out of sight, never landing until the watcher turns his eyes away in resignation. His dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men now. Women forget all those things they don't wanna remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth. Then they act and do things accordingly. And that comes to us from their eyes are watching God. The reason why I think that this is central to the way that we need to think about Zora Neale Hurston as an academic, not just as a literary uh, personality or as a woman fully really as a woman of letters is because it allows us to be able to think about the way that she weaves in the narrative, the telling of story, the critical engagement of cultural folk in the ways that we understand her creation of the, the things of the letters, right? Of her literary creations of her screenwriting, of her playwriting, right? Because it allows us to really be able to think about the ways that we can function within a given space. The creativity of letters allows us to think about how we're able to function as members of a future past. Now I have trained as a rhetorician and as a humanist, but I also trained as a critical scholar. And so what that means is I think about the way that the future is always moving, but it's always connected to its past. As an, a womanist rhetorical scholar, it means that I also see time as cyclical, that it's never started, it's never ended, it just continues, right? that the way that we understand Afrofuturism is a way that we understand, again, that idea of the future past. It's the same way that we can look at the present future. We're always in the now, and in our now, we're always in our future. I think that actually links back as well to that ability to remember what you wanna remember and forget all the rest. There is something clear about the way that we need to think about Zora Neale Hurston and her legacy in terms of Afrofuturism. When I asked around to colleagues about whether or not they would consider Zora Neale Hurston an Afrofuturist, a lot of folks said no, but they would consider her part of the Black speculative tradition. I'm actually willing to put her in both places. And here's why. 
because I see Afrofuturism as a theory, a method, a means of cultural production, which is uniquely tied to its future past, I see Zora Neale Hurston as part of that tradition in that she gives us a way through reading her, particularly her ethnographic work as critical cultural ethnographic work, she gives us a way to be able to march in to a future in letters, humanities, and social sciences that allows us to think more broadly about the applications of research when it comes to the understanding of world making by folk, right? So what we're really looking at here is how do folk understand their positionality? How do folk understand their communicative spaces? How do folk understand their ability to engage in future preservation of their past and enactments of their present? Too often, we want to say that those kinds of activities are really the activities of the rich, of the wealthy, of the educated, of the elite. Because we want to be able to say that there is an exclusionary process through which preservation of the past, enactment of the present, and, pl and planning for the future are things that require time or they require money, or they require particular skill sets. And we often want to cut the folk off from those things. And Zora tells us that that's the mistake. That's where we go wrong. It is in bringing in the folk and looking at the ways that they do that with the resources that they have, that we're able to look at the longevity of our futures, at the depth of our past, right? Several years back when outside was open and we were allowed to go places, I went to the Smithsonian. I love the Smithsonian. I mean, what nerdy little kid doesn't love the museum? <laughs> but I went and I remember I ended up doing this uh, backstage tour as part of a conference that I had attended in, in the DC area. And one of the things that the scholars there talked about were the things that the Smithsonian had collected over the years. And one of the people said, you know, one of the things that, that we just don't have enough of is just regular everyday things that just regular women used. I don't know why, but I laughed out loud like laughed, right? And then she was like, well, why do you think that's, you know, Dr. Taylor, why do you think that's funny? And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> the, on what day do museums value folk things? Do museums value folk? We value folk when it's time for folk to come to the museum and pay their entrance fee. But do we value folk when we go to look for collections? Do we value folk when we go to ask what kinds of things should represent them in these hallowed cultural spaces? Sadly not. And one of the things that I think is so, so precious and so important about celebrating the work of Zora Neale Hurston is she didn't wait for the museum to come and say, we're gonna put a value on your folk. She valued our folk and collected our stories and our photos and our films. And she didn't just collect them as a means of analysis, she collected them as a means of protecting and preserving our past so that we could have a future past. We could have a present past. We could have a past future. I can't even imagine what my scholarship would look like without Zora Neale Hurston. I honestly can't. I likely would not have been standing in the Smithsonian's back rooms laughing at a tour guide, <laughs> right? 
I likely would not have thought that it was possible to study the sermons of black women in order to look at the and understand the ways that black women use the pulpit as a as a planning space as a workspace for social justice and social equity. It is her work. It is Zora's work as a critical autoethnographer, as a critical ethnographer that allows all of us to see a way of understanding the value of folk as not just data points, but valuable cultural contributors. So what are some of my favorites? Dust track on the road is full, 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 full of things. Going back and reading that text again, and if you haven't done it, order a copy from your favorite local bookseller uh, and read it again. <laughs> um, it, is, it is amazing. I stayed up all night recently and read it cover to cover. <laughs> I, read, I originally planned to read just a couple of quick, clear chapters, um, particularly where she uh, starts talking about her educational background and, and the reasons why she got into anthropology uh, in order to really sort of give some, uh, some background to this talk. And then I decided, no, I'm going to go back and read the whole thing again, right? And I'm staying up all night. And the reason for that is because the thing that I started really to think about, and I have it in my email, it's one of my favorite quotes from her. It's on my website too. <laughs> is the quote that says, research is formalized curiosity. And I love that quote, right? Research is formalized curiosity. And it allowed me to start to think about and really ask the question for this talk, if research is formalized curiosity and we're mocked to death by time, by the rudeness of it, but also by the sweetness of it. If we don't bring these things together as scholars, what happens? For the last year and a half, I've been teaching at Texas Southern University, and I'm excited to see that some of my colleagues are here today. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed teaching at Texas Southern is that I teach in a graduate program now. Last night, I taught Intro to Graduate Methods. Now, some of you in the community who are scholars yourselves will remember that first master's class in methods. And maybe you don't remember anymore because as Zora tells us um, that, you know, we forget things if we don't need them or don't want them or just find them so problematic we can't hold on to it. One of the things I promised myself very early in my career is there's certain things I wouldn't have amnesia about. And one of them is about what it means to learn as a scholar, right? I thought my met first methods class, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I remember actually going home and crying one night. And my father, who's passed on now, was like, I can't believe you're going to let a class make you cry. On what day did that even happen? Oh, apparently today. Right. And I was like, but daddy, it's so hard. <laughs> I hate it here. And he said to me, baby girl, it's just research. You know what research is? And I said, what? He was like, questions. The thing that you used to get in trouble for, kindergarten, really actually daycare <laughs> through 12th grade, <laughs> is a thing that somebody will pay you for. I remember looking at him and thinking, he has clearly lost his mind. But I said, okay. And that day I also thought, if questions is a thing I can pay for, I can ask some questions now. And not too long after that, I actually stumbled on this quote from Zora Neale Hurston, research is formalized curiosity. And I thought, well, 
if research is formalized curiosity, then what else does it do? How else does it function? Where else does it go? And because I went back and read Dust Tracks on the Road again recently, I guess I'd forgotten the rest of that quote or I'd never, I didn't remember the next sentence, but I wrote it down and I put it in my research journal for myself for this year to remember that the next sentence after that is, it is poking and prying with a purpose. It's not just that we ask questions, it's the purpose that we do them with. It is the way that we poke and we prod. One of the things that I think is important to remember as a faculty member, and what I told my students last night, is that as researchers, as scholars, we need to bring our whole selves into the way that we poke and we prod at knowledge production, at knowledge creation, at the securing of our future past. Don't just let it happen. What we get from Zora Neale Hurston is that push that says, don't just let it happen. Time is rude. Time will mock you. Time will happen. And if you just let it happen, it will mock you to death. You won't have a future past. All you will have is the present. And the present isn't worth much because it doesn't stay long. I think about how we can make a difference in the way that we move our scholarship forward. And I look at what it means to structure my research agenda and to help mentor my students and my colleagues in the ways that they structure their research agendas. And I am often captured with this idea of the future present or the future past. Research is always going forward. It's always moving into a future space. As scholars, right, we're often interested in not just how, how uh, folk manifest in the present moment, we're really interested in how folk will manifest in the future present or the future past. Where will they be? What will happen? How will they go forward? How are we implicated in that process, right? And I think folk, just regular folk, are interested in that too. And the way that I understand this is I, I think about the way people talk about their grandmothers, right? And if you remember last fall when we were all inside, right? Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion dropped the WAP video. Listen, that was a great moment in culture, future, present. I taught it for class. <laughs> it was so much fun. But one of my favorite things about it was when people would post these videos of their grandmothers watching that video, right? And talking about sex and sexuality. And it always struck me how people looked at their grandmothers like they were shocked that their grandmothers knew what those words meant, right? And I'm like, you got here some kind of way. <laughs> And it wasn't immaculate conception. You are not Jesus. <laughs> How else did you think you, you didn't think your grandma dropped it like it was hot? I, I don't understand how you didn't come to that. And then I realized in talking with my mother, she said, my mother, your grandmother, was probably a more open kind of woman than most people would be comfortable with. So I was like, but I loved her and she was ours. And my grandmother was the future present. My grandmother was the future past. My grandmother was a time traveler. 
she was the kind of time traveler that I imagine Zora Neale Hurston is and was. The kind of person that always has within her the ability to call forward the past of our ancestors and the way that she tells stories and the way that she links moments that is respectful of the past in which they occurred, but is grateful for the future in which they live. My grandmother is the first person I called when I said I was going to accept a tenure track position at Prairie View a and Now I'd been to Texas, I think twice in my life at that point. And my grandmother said, Ooh, baby girl, are you sure? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's Grammy, it's a tenure track job in 2009, which is <laughs> a rough year to be graduating with a PhD and <laughs> trying to find a tenure track job in communication. And she said, well, watch out for them Prairie View boys, baby, don't drop it. Pardon? <laughs> that is not what I expected my grandmother to say. But as a well-trained rhetorician and ethnographer, I said, huh, <laughs> can you tell me more about that? She was like, oh, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> she's like, those Prairie View boys have always been fine. They've always been fast. Don't get caught up. Ma'am? <laughs> The last time you would have been around a Prairie View boy was in 1940. How fast were these boys in 1940? And my grandmother went on to tell me about more than one very funny story. Her father was, my great grandfather was a trustee for uh, what is now known as the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And as a member of the board of trustees, they often hosted parties and events at their home, which isn't far from the university itself. And she had story after story of Prairie View football players and business majors and various sundry other college students and their faculty who came for various events, symposia and conferences like this one through her time living there just up until the beginning of World War II. And they were amazing and familiar. It is so nice to know that college students haven't changed at all. But that's what I mean about the way that we understand the future past. My grandmother was calling from the past into the future these very particular moments around the, the social aspects of higher education and what it means to be a member of a scholarly community and the extent to which a scholarly community exists. She wasn't a student at Pine Bluff, but she was a member of that community because her father was a member of that community and she could speak to a realness about that community. When, when that video dropped this summer, I thought about my grandma. I thought about what she would think seeing that video. I thought about how she would dance to that music. Because for her, Understanding the culture of folk, the culture of Blackness, was always about living that experience in all of its richness and fullness. I remember she would, whenever different songs or music would come on, she would dance and she would say, oh baby, if you can't dance to the new, you'll die to the old that didn't always make sense until I was 40. <laughs> but now, also in the characteristic of thinking through what it means for Zora Neale Hurston to exist in the future present, allows me to think about my grandmother 
and what she understood about the same time space and how we move forward in these spaces. What does it look like? As academics, I think it's important for us to think about particularly how these spaces move forward and what is our responsibility to them? And even yes, what is our right to them? I'll start with our right to them. We have none. Because again, time is rude. We have a responsibility to these spaces. We have a responsibility to these stories. We have a responsibility to these narratives to present them in a way that is authentic, that is clear, that is centered within their original cultural space and production. We have a responsibility in the recording, in the sharing, in the telling to be accurate to be honest, to be respectful. But we don't have a right to tell these stories. Even if we are members of the cultural groups we're telling the stories about. <clears throat> to say that we have a right to tell these stories is to assume exclusivity of them. <coughs> Excuse me, throat's getting dry. And the danger of researchers is when we assume exclusivity, when we assume that the stories that we are telling, that the narratives that we are capturing, that we are theorizing from, that the method that we are applying provides some exclusive knowledge or capture some exclusive moment that we have the right to tell or the right to keep. We will always destroy our own future past when we have a moment of right. We will kill us. So the thing that I remind my, my graduate students and my undergraduate students is that as scholars, they have a responsibility, but they do not have a right. And as responsible scholars, they need to walk in that Zora Neale Hurston space and tell the stories that they're responsible to tell, but also hold secret those stories that the folk have entrusted you with to know, but not to tell. Hurston alludes to this in her memoir, that there are stories that she was entrusted with when she talks about her time with the Hoodoo priests in both New Orleans and in Haiti. She talks a little bit about this, right? And she gives us this small, very small, tantalizing moments into her present future where we understand what her training was, what she took part in, but she doesn't give us a blow by blow TikTok of what happened, right? She doesn't talk about the meanings of the cultural practice but she gives us a rich and dynamic description of the culture and allows us to imagine what it would mean to participate as a believer, but also as a religious leader. And that's what I mean about as scholars, our responsibility to the future past. Our responsibility to the future past is to be able to tell those narratives, tell those stories, provide that rich description, but also hold sacred and hold secret those things that we've been told but aren't asked to share. This is also part of the preservation process. 
and how we preserve culture, how we preserve folk. It means respecting the way that folk present themselves, the way that folk presents and owns its culture. And what is our responsibility to protect that preservation so that it'll be there for the past, it'll stay there for the present, and it'll come here for our future. When we think about what our responsibilities are as scholars, I want us to think about our responsibilities in the framework of the future past so that we are not mocked to death by time, so that we are able to add into the Smithsonian, those regular folk things, into our digital collections and libraries, into our scholarship and our research, those things that we have the responsibility to share. And we hold back intentionally those things that have been shared with us but are not our responsibility to talk about. That we always have an eye to our future but a protection of our past. That we really think about what that means. That we walk in line and in light with Zora and we think about all of the things that we benefit from that she didn't tell us so that we can walk forward remembering everything we don't want to forget knowing that the dream is the truth that we can act accordingly as scholars and as folk and be able to protect and preserve the future past. Thank you. So much. Um, <laughs> We, we were expecting Julian to pop in. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so he caught us a little by surprise. Here he is. <laughs> uh, there you are. Yeah. Hey, Julian. Uh, uh, I, I'm also going to invite uh, Trent Mango to join me here. And he's going to uh, lead the uh, discussion on this end, Julian uh, through the chat. Uh, I'd like to ask a question before you get started, Julian. Uh, a very sort of basic question. Uh, to Dr. Taylor, uh, can you, I was trying to grasp as you were speaking, mm -hmm. this idea of future present, mm -hmm. but can you elaborate on that just a little bit more for those of us who didn't quite catch what that meant? Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of, for me, the idea of the future present is the way that we position ourselves in our present moment with an understanding of how that turns into a future space. Right. So I'm trained as a rhetorician, but lately I've been doing a lot more work in digital humanities and in Afrofuturism. And so I've been thinking a lot about sort of how do you move forward, right? How do you move, how do you move your research forward, but also move folks forward with you, right? So that the folk come with you. Um, years ago when I was a master's student, I had a, a colleague who asked me who I was writing for which was a mind blowing question at the time, <laughs> right? Um, and and I, I said, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. And she was like, well, are you writing for other scholars like yourself? Cause I know you wanna go on and get a PhD and be a scholar, or are you writing for regular folk, right? For the regular church folk? Are you writing, are you going to write in a way, because even then I wanted to write about black women and all of my scholarship was sort of focused in that space. And she was like, are you gonna write in a way that the regular black church lady, usher number one at the Baptist church that you grew up in can read your work and recognize herself in it? Or are you going to write in a way where 
she reads your work and is like, I have absolutely no idea. But ain't the baby cute? Look at the baby. The baby wrote a thing. Isn't that adorable? Right? And I was like, oh, no, uh -uh. <laughs> right. I want to write in a way that is always here for the present future. I want people in the moment. I want my folk. I want my grandmother to be able to read my work and see herself in my work and understand that she's also part of the future of the way that this moves forward. Right. Um, and so that's that's what I'm thinking of when I'm when I'm thinking of the future present. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, I don't know if anybody else here have any questions. So Julian, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in my defense, you know, Scott introduced you. So Scott gets the first, first poke to ask you a question. I do appreciate um, your emphasis in your talk on a kind of folk knowledge, right? So I, I I appreciate especially you calling us to rethink what we understand about Zora Neale Hurston as an interdisciplinary scholar and as the frameworks that she offered in terms of like knowledge and its production, which I think is a very Afrofuturist. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I'm one of those people who go, Zora Neale Hurston is Afrofuturist. And it's part of the reason that I thought it was great to have you as a keynote. I do want to say happy birthday. I did not know it was your <laughs> birthday. So happy birthday. Um, <laughs> I really, I, I wish I'd have known it was your birthday. I would have tried to do something special for you. Uh, but um, instead of putting you to work on your birthday, <laughs> <laughs> I personally don't like to work on my birthday. So I'm like, oh. I gave uh, up a ghost on that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that there is a question in the, in the chat um, that's about time and I don't, I'm not, it's a question asking you, could you um, think about the pandemic in terms of a rude time or I, 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 I'm not quite getting the question and I don't wanna murder the question, but I think this question of like how our time has been disrupted, which I think actually, you know, like you, I do wonder sometimes what would it be like if Zoya Hurston had a Twitter account? She was here for social media, like she would have things to say, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think she would have a lot to say about systemic failure right now and what Black people, how Black people might navigate this. I think this is a recurring theme when we talk about Black cultural production and so on and so forth. So could you talk a little bit about you know, this question of time and folk and knowledge that you sort of alluded to in your, your, your lecture. Yeah, I think that um, I, 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 <laughs> I guess I'm sort of that classic scholar that's always writing like five things at once, right? And so in thinking about this and thinking about this again, shout out to Goylan Williams for this, for when I was like, I don't know what to, I want to talk about time and I want to talk about the future past. And, and he was like, oh, go with this quote. And I'm like, this is why you have to stay friends with people who are currently working on their scholarship as students because he had just read it and I hadn't read it in years. So there you go. Um, so shout out to him and, and again, thanks again for that. Um, and what, what it allowed me to think about at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm also one of those scholars who, you know, I work through the things I don't understand <laughs> by going to the past things that I've already read and that I might understand. And so I was like, well, we've, we've had a global pandemic a century ago. I wonder what black folks were saying then. <laughs> So I instantly went to look for all of the Black scholars and what they were saying about the pandemic, right? And I was pleasantly surprised and still am a little bit disturbed by how little there is organized around it. The truth is, even I had not really thought about the pandemic, the influenza pandemic of 1917 through 19, 1919 um, in a systematic way because we read that time period through the Red Summer, 
right? We, especially for African-American scholars, right? If you're, you're a scholar in, in African-American studies, you read it through the early nascent beginnings of the Harlem, what will become the Harlem Renaissance. You read it through the social activism of the railroad car uh, workers, through the activism of the women launderer, launderers who were trying to create a union in Chicago. You read it through um, uh, Ida B. Wells, right? And her work uh, really looking at the, the lynchings, right? That were happening at the time. And you read it through uh, World War I, right? And around all of those things, <laughs> was a global pandemic that was killing black people, right? Talk about being mocked to death by time and how freaking rude it all is, <laughs> right? So in going back and kind of starting to read that, I actually am working on a project that'll be uh, published in May on uh, the way that the black press covered the pandemic, um, the influenza pandemic of the previous century. And one of the things that I found really interesting um, in, and what I've started to find really interesting in that is some of the early writings of those scholars that would later become um, Harlem Renaissance people of letters, right? Like Du Bois. Um, and even to a tiny baby extent, Hurston, right? Cause she actually ends up writing, she starts writing not too long after that. Um, and sort of what are the things for Hurston, she's really talking about it in terms of uh, more in terms of a past future, right? Um, because it had already happened, right? She's not necessarily an adult. Um, she is kind of working through that moment, right? She's experiencing it as a person, but she doesn't have the critical tools at the time to talk about it in the present moment. So she's talking about it in the future moment. So it's a future past when she's talking about it, right? And so what has started to allow me, this current pandemic has started to allow me to think about is sort of, again, what is our responsibility as scholars to really write about this moment and what it's doing to us and how we're functioning through it, right? and to be able to hold more than one thing at a time, right? I, the, the thing that I found a little bit disturbing when I went back, when I started going back to look for information is that there were so many things happening that people tended to just do one thing, but it's shocking how little there is written by the contemporary scholars of the moment about that pandemic and what it was doing to folks, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's one of those things that because there's not enough written about it um, that was contemporary at the time, it now becomes more of the past past, right? It's not something that we can go back and get, right? But I choose to think of it as kind of that relationship to, it might be also in relationship to sort of that, that responsibility that we have as scholars, right? That really when people were looking around and thinking about their responsibility as scholars, they might've looked around and thought, there's so many other things going on, right? That maybe we need to focus on these parts, right? Because right now, one of the things that's going on, well, in there right now, one of the things that was going on was organizing union, you know, trying to organize unions of day laborers and laundresses and <laughs> janitors and those folks who were having to go out and work in the pandemic. Doesn't that sound familiar, right? I'm trying to figure out a way for those folks to stay alive and to be able to come home to their families and not make their family sick, right? And I think there's something in that that we can look at to look at how was that organizing happening then? How can we replicate that now? Right, especially to your point that I think, <laughs> I think Zora Neale Hurston would be absolutely both, I think she would laugh and, and probably be both like astonished, but also not at all surprised 
by um, sort of the perpetuation of certain kinds of systematic oppressions, right? That she would probably be like, well, I mean, I tried <laughs> to get y'all to see the value in doing certain things and you didn't. And so here you still are, right? <laughs> um, I, I read uh, in, in preparing for this talk that she had written a number of scholars about creating, using lands um, that were owned, I believe by the AME church that were part of their universities to create um, a cemeteries for black scholars, right? Um, in a way, really looking into her own future present, right? And realizing that at some point she's gonna die and she's gonna need a place to be buried. And that knowing probably, I'd imagine writing those letters, she was probably sitting there looking at her own pocketbook going, listen, I, I, who's gonna take care of this, right? So it wasn't something that was just for herself, but it was something that was for her folk, right? She's probably looking around at other women like herself and even men and thinking, we all need a place to go to be remembered, to be valued, to be able to be called forward in a future present, right? And people thought, you know, she got a variety of what I would call in a, with some whiskey, a different kind of moment. But since I have water and we're still <laughs> in the daytime, <laughs> I will say she got a variety of irresponsible answers. Um, yeah, uh, her her placement in terms of uh, institutions and power is always interesting. Interesting thought. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a, a question again from uh, NY the Theories, executive director of PC and. Um, she says, it's really interesting to hear your appreciation based on your training for Hurston's Dust Tracks on the Road, because many literary scholars are, as she says it, frankly dismissive of an autobiograph autobiography as representative of a weaker work. Um, can you expand a bit on why, based on your training, you are so respectful of Dust Tracks? Oh, sure. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm trained, I'm a communication scholar, I'm trained as a rhetorician. So uh, for us, for rhetoric, we're always looking at the personal narrative, right? Or the public speech, right? Uh, and so the thing I tell my students is I, I'm trained as, because I'm trained as a rhetorician, I teach them um, to be rhetoricians as well, um, that we're often focused on the dead old white guys and I was trained to at least know who they were and what their famous speeches were. And then I don't do any of them. <laughs> I don't study any of them. Um, I feel that there are plenty of people in the world to be able to take care of that. I study uh, Black women, men, folks, right? And the way that as Black folks, we're always speaking ourselves into our future present, into our past present, into our, our present future, right? Uh, that, that through Zora Neale Hurston, what we get is just a really beautiful understanding of, again, of folk, of how we talk, right? What do we sound like when we're talking to each other? And it's us, right? And there's something so awesome about that, right? Uh, and as a communication scholar, I, I also, I look at rhetoric as not just the big speeches. Uh, I look at rhetoric as daily world creation, right? Because it's the way that we create the world and the environment around us that we speak into space. And we do that through verbal, uh, presentations. We do that through nonverbal presentations. We do that uh, satorally through what we wear. We do it environmentally through the way that we decorate and present our space. And for me, I think that the probably the next project based on on 
this talk that I wrote up is actually going to be to write up um, a sort of a reason why we really need to think about Zora Neale Hurston in the space, right, as a critical ethnographer, as a critical cultural scholar, um, because she isn't thought of that way enough. Um, and there are things that I see in the works of Robin Boylorn and uh, uh, Amber Johnson uh, and even in Bernadette Kellefeld, right? These women who are doing critical autoethnography and critical ethnography now that are directly connected to the way that Zora Neale Hurston presents dust tracks, right? that even in the work of E. Patrick Johnson, right? There's a way that, that if you look at his work in, in Black queerness, right? That is directly correlated to the way that Hurston positions her own voice. And I didn't see that before. And I see it now, now I feel like I can't unsee it and I want everybody else to see it too. <laughs> There's a question at UCF, I think. Hi, yes, I have a quick question. Um, I appreciate your talk because um, I'm a student of rhetoric and composition myself. And okay. so it's really great to see someone in rhetoric talk about Hurston because that usually doesn't happen. Um, but I'm really interested in your concept of future past, um, especially how the, uh, the future has passed us by already in ways. Um, but how do you position her engagement with hoodoo and conjure? Because I know you mentioned it in her, um, her travels to New Orleans. Um, how do you engage that work um, with this concept of future past? Because usually, if you think about spirit, if you think about spirit work, it's outside of time, it's outside of the rude time, or it's outside of the body, or it, go, um, it brings us deeper into our body through like, you know, possession and church shouting and things of that nature that people are still doing, right? So um, yeah, how do you position Hurston's spiritual work with this concept mm -hmm. of time, basically? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Uh, the way that I kind of think through that is I think there's nothing more emblematic of the future past than conjure work, honestly. <laughs> nothing, right? Because it is both in and out of time, right? Um, and it is a way, and I think that the way she talks about conjure work is so powerful because she talks about conjure work as time travel almost, right? That you're, you're leaving your space and coming back to space and moving past space, right? You're leaving time and moving through time and going back in time, right? And the way that I think about that in terms of the future past is in terms of the cyclical way that we're always both, right? We're always both the past and the future, right? That we're, we're not, I think there's a way in Western culture where we tend to think of time as discrete and stagnant, right? That there's a break between the past and the present. There's a break between the present and the future. And the way that I am envisioning and working through the concept of future past is that there is no break, right? The easiest way to think of it is, is sort of as a circle, but really it's, it's really a circle overlapped with a square on top of an oval. <laughs> right? Um, and it's all going down in a drilling circle and then coming back up, right? And I think that, that the way Hurston talks about conjure work is, is probably the most um, tactile way to understand the, the future past, right? Because in spiritual work, in the spiritual work that she was doing that she did, is a way that you also stay alive into the future, right? Because your spirit stays alive into the future and is called back into the past, right? Um, and so it, uh, it reminds me of sort of that conjure tradition 
really sort of the black folk tradition that exists in all spiritual practices of um, calling the ancestors, right? That our ancestors aren't ever actually dead, right? We don't think of them that way, right? I still talk to my dad every day, right? And my father passed away, his body is gone. It's been gone 20 years, but his spirit, his soul, his future lives with me. It lives with my siblings. It li lives with my nephews, right? It lives with my mom. He's still here for us, right? And I think about this in terms, particularly when I'm thinking about the future past, I think about it too in the way that I remember when I was 14, I was really upset and I, I went to my grandmother and I, um, I said to her, you know, all of these kids at high school, they're talking about me and they're picking on me and they're saying really rude things about me. And they're, they're talking about my, I'm too tall and my butt's too big and my skin's too light and, you know, all of these things, right? And then, you know, and she was like, okay, listen. She's like, I'm gonna tell you something. I said, okay. And she said, at the end of the day, all you have is your peace of mind. And you cannot afford to give pieces of your mind to people who don't matter, who won't pay a nickel for their own thought. Girl, don't do that. Because you'll wake up one day and you won't have any mind left to give. So stop that. And then she said, everybody gets talked about. What you want to think about is how do you walk around in the world so that people talk about you in the positive and think about you as a contributor to their well being and their peace of mind by protecting your own? She said, Listen, Hitler been dead and folks still talking about him. What do you want people to say about you? Right? And I think about that in terms of ancestors, right? People been dead and we still talk about them. Zora Neale Hurston, been dead. We still talk about her, right? Thank God, <laughs> right? And some of us still talk to her, right? We ask her questions. We, and in that space, and this is why I love the way that she also talks about these sort of spiritual practices of blackness, right? We can conjure her up and ask the question and get her answer because praise God, she wrote a lot. And so we have her with us, right? We can, we, can, we can think through her in really critical and engaging ways, I think, that let her live, right? In the future present with us. And that is so cool. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the, the emphasis that you place it on a kind of democratization of knowledge. And one of the things about, uh, I think our, our theme for this year is that sound is a technology that democratizes knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is one of the things that uh, our first keynote from Eric sort of hints at. And I think it's one of the things that is sort of central to your, your talk as well. Mm -hmm. um, for you, what's the knowledge that sound is the most important vehicle for? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, you're wow, Julian. <laughs> so, okay, so I grew up in Northern California, and there's a school for the deaf in Fremont that we used to pass when we go to the BART station. And I was always fascinated by how much communicating was happening with so little sound, right? And I still am. One of the things that I think sound allows us to do is to provide character to certain kinds of things. But I don't know that sound is required for knowledge creation, knowledge production, knowledge preservation, 
right? I'm not willing to make that argument because I see that there's knowledge and there's value in knowledge that's created and produced that doesn't necessarily have a sound, right? That the sound is coded as silence, but even silence sounds like something, <laughs> right? And so I guess as a communicator, that's my communication scholar answer, yes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a good that's a good answer that's a good answer um yes is always a good answer right um yes and is the, always the answer. Right. um <laughs> I'll check, I'll check see if there's any other questions no uh all right well i'm gonna um can I, can I give a quick shout out i saw that in my mom actually sent me a text message and my mom is here hi mom love you oh. hi mom <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, can, can I, I ask a question? The, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Julian. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, I was thinking about communication because you know this little backstory here, going about how we're trying to learn how to communicate in this environment. You know, I mean, things are enabled by this technology, but also what I'm thinking about is I can't glance over at Julian. He's not in the room here, and so. I'm feeling that weird disconnect. It's like we're trying to make this like it's a natural conversation, but a lot of it is this visual cue stuff or with Trent, and we're talking through masks. Um, we're looking in the wrong direction. The camera's over here, the screen is up here. And it, it makes me think about communication um, in the present as we kind of revisit Zora Neale Hurston and her works. But I wanted to ask you about how what you're talking about today um, connects with your interest in digital humanities. And um, just some thoughts about that as a kind of framework for understanding this topic. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think that communication scholars are probably gonna have a lot of fun teaching nonverbal um, <laughs> because there are a lot of things we used to teach people about nonverbal communication that do not apply the same way through mediated communication. And we always taught those things as separate. Um, and I remember even in graduate school, I remember asking a professor once, um, which I did not get an answer to, uh, why we teach nonverbal separate from mediated communication, right? And I said, I remember asking, I was like, why do we do that? Because at some point these things are gonna come together, right? And this is early 2000, like 2001, 2002. I'm like, these things are gonna crash into each other and it's gonna be bad. <laughs> um, and he didn't really have an answer. I think his answer was yes. Um, <laughs> and, and that's what you're here for. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I want an answer. You are the professor, give me an answer, right? I turned into the worst version of my now undergrads and graduate students. Um, but I, I just put it in the background. I was like, well, someday I'll think about it. And here we are. <laughs> uh, and so I think that there are ways that we're going to have to retrain ourselves to think about um, how, what the, what the cultural value is that we put on eye contact, that we put on um, ver, ver, uh, visual cues and how those function differently, right? Um, when I teach public speaking, I teach my students to make eye contact with all the speakers in the room. And that's really awkward <laughs> on, on video, right? Because one of the things that we learned very quickly at the beginning of this is depending on how you signed in and what the order is, right? The eye contact you're making with people is very specific to how it looks on your screen, which might not be the same way it looks on somebody else's screen, right? You're not in the same space. And so, uh, so I think that it's gonna mean that we're gonna study a lot of that differently. Now, the way that that's gonna work with digital humanities, I think, and the way that I would love, 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 love to see digital humanities engage with Zora and Zora's collection is a few things. I have a few dream projects that I'd like somebody else to take on because I don't have time. <laughs> so here's a to-do list. Tonisha's dream digital humanities Zora Newhurston project. 
Um, one would be a network analysis of all of the women that she worked with, knew, corresponded with, uh, and their research production, right? And this is a dream I have, not just for Zora Neale Hurston, but for every black woman of letters, right? I am fascinated by how and when and where we talk to each other as black women and what that produces, right? So I would love to see a digital project that, that does that, that networked analysis and looks at all of the people that she knew across her life and how they impacted her, how she impacted them and what their conversations and letters were like, right? Even just a network that visualized all of those women would be a start, right? I'll take it. Um, the other thing that I would love to see is um, probably all a kind of a, um, not a compendium, but a, a collection of all of her written work, right? The screenplays, um, the things that she wrote for television and film, the things that she wrote for stage plays, novels, her, her memoirs, her ethnography and autoethnographic work, for it to all be digitized and kind of run through, like I would actually love to see a voyant visualization of all of her work, right? Um, because I imagine that because of the kind of ethnographic and autoethnographic work she did, um, there are a lot of words that we have probably in our scholarship now that we have because she wrote them, right? Uh, that there's a lot of words that we still use and we still see in Black, use just amongst Black folks, right? Or folks in general, right? American folks that are still here in part of our lexicon because she wrote down those narratives through her autoethnographic and her ethnographic work. And so I would love to see like a big, sort of a, a big DH project around digitizing her work um, and then visualizing those words and what that means, right? Um, because I would imagine if we look at her work, similarly, but in some ways more than like other scholars, her other contemporaries, that she impacted our creative culture in larger ways that have gone vastly underappreciated. And part of that is just because we didn't have the tools to really do it. And part of it is because she was um, appreciated but underappreciated during her life, right? And so the diversity of her um, contributions is not discussed, right? We put in my opinion, way, 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 way too much work or in on just her literary, um, her literary contributions. Not that they're not important, they're very important, but I think, and I think we know this and we can conjure this, we can conjure her into this space and know this because we see it in her, in Dust Tracks, right? She is focused on her work as a woman of letters. And she stays focused on that throughout her entire career. She doesn't just see herself as a novelist, right? It's a novelist and, right? And so I, that, those, are, those are my two dream projects um, that I would, I would love to see. There are probably some others if I give it some thought. So if somebody gave me some money in a digital humanities center and a team, um, it would definitely be one of, <laughs> there would be a few probably <laughs> projects that I would work on um, that I think are, are really, 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 really valuable. Yeah. Um, this is actually a sort of a bit of a follow-up. I'm an archivist, so I really appreciated the emphasis by both speakers today on um, preserving the um, cultural production by everyday people and folk. And um, I, my question is, I was especially intrigued by the idea of um, preserving those everyday experiences and 
things like everyday sounds and um and as someone who's been a traditional archivist working in an archive which as we all know has not have not done a great job of documenting uh folks of color ordinary or otherwise um I, my question sort of has two parts one is just i'm intrigued logistically if someone gave you a bunch of money and a center and staff what would how would you document those things you know a gig a child's giggle or how what would that look like in your in an ideal world and then the second piece is given the shortcomings i mean obviously that ideal wouldn't have to be within a traditional archive but if it were um how you know something like that is so much more intimate than even what we've already done a bad job of collecting which is traditional paper records so how do you how how might institutions move beyond develop enough trust does that make sense you know when, yeah, when we haven't yeah. even been good at the traditional stuff to something that's really intimate and personal right right i think that we can look to zora for that right um one of the things that i um i don't i don't know how to stop researching let me just say that right so this morning i got up and i thought oh, zora neil hurston is listed as a director of a film why? What happened? Where are my notes? I don't have any. Oh my God, let me find that, right? So I praise God for the internet and the ability to do bunny slipper research, right? So there I am, still in my slippers, <laughs> sitting bolt up in the bed at four in the morning, <laughs> right? Looking for this. And I think we can look to her for this idea of what we can archive and how, right? So she archived in short films uh, that I believe, I'm gonna have to look for my note that I made this morning, <laughs> I believe are in the archive at Columbia, but some of them are also in the National Archive in DC. And I think we can look to her for some of that, right? Again, going back to what I said during my talk about responsibility. It's not our responsibility as scholars to capture everything, but it is our responsibility as scholars to when we capture things to be responsive to that capture and to hold those things in trust and authenticity. Um, and so I think that especially now today, right, one of the ways that we can look at how do we responsibly do this is to reach out to folks when we collect things in Instagram collections or Facebook collections or Twitter collections. And if we're gonna use those things for our research, reach out to those individuals and thank them for creating this moment and ask them if they would allow us to share it, right? If they would allow us to keep it. Now, I've talked to a lot of scholars over the years who have said like, well, is it that serious? I mean, if they post it on our public Facebook and I'm like, this is the thing though about folk. Folk don't read. <laughs> Heck, I don't read everything. I haven't read every piece of the manual about who owns what when I submit a tweet. And they change so rapidly. I don't even, whatever the rules were when I got my Twitter account in I think 2009 are not the rules now, <laughs> right? Twitter turned over their whole archive to the, the Library of Congress. So what does that mean now, <laughs> right? Now, I will say as a scholar, my thinking is that is going to be an amazing archive that to study communication in a way we've never been able to study it before. Right. Um, uh, Goylen Williams, who I called out earlier, he and I gave a talk at um, South by Southwest a few years back. And during that that presentation and that talk, I said, we're in a fascinating moment where we cannot just archive regular folks. Right? But we can also study communication in a way that we've never been able to study it before. We always studied it before by looking at mediated communication, so television, radio, film, that was saved, that could be recorded, that could be kept in an archive, right? In the same way that we keep a book, right? 
or even the great speeches because those speeches were written down, right? I think this is something that, uh, that Dr. Painter talks about in looking at Sojourner Truth speeches, right? That what Truth probably said is, aren't I a woman? Because her first language was Dutch versus ain't I a woman, which was what was captured by the Southern journalist who wrote the speech down, right? We're now in a moment where we can actually go back and look at and compare the text of the delivered, the text of the written speech, the text of the delivered speech, the press account of the delivered speech, and the audience reaction to the delivered speech. And that's the part we've never been able to do before, right? And for the archive, I think for traditional archivists, what it means is being able to think in those sort of larger kind of future present kind of ways, right? Where we think about what are the, what's the totality of this moment, right? I think too often, even when we think about collecting papers, right? Zora Neale Hurston pops up in all kinds of people's um, archives, right? In all kinds of people people's papers, right? Because different people have been preserved in the archive, right? And to go to the previous question can be conjured up through that preservation. And so she can get conjured up too, right? But I think that what we can do as a collective is really start to think about how do we preserve these moments in a way that yes, is systematic, right? That yes, is formalized because Hurston appreciated the formalization of questions <laughs> and curiosity, um, but that also is legible, right? Um, and needs to be legible and open to the community. It can't just be for the scholarly folk. It has to be for the regular folk, right? Like I, I think about because of my great grandfather and, and his work, right? I think, you know, one, one day, actually, what I think is I'm going to go to Arkansas and check out that farm because I've never actually been. But I also think, you know, if I walked into the archive at Pine Bluff and saw a whole bunch of his papers, what would that even mean to me? Right? What does that look like to me? Um, I know, I think I know what it looks like to me as a scholar, but I don't know what it means to me as family. Right, And I think that part of what we have to do when we're thinking about what the responsibility of the archive is, is we have to think about the archive as responsible, number one, <laughs> right? And not abdicate responsibility for the past, right? In the future present, in the past present, we also need to recognize that in the past, there were some decisions that were made and not all of them were great. Some of them are really effed up. <laughs> and we need to just own that and then move forward from that um, and say, okay, we're, we're not going to keep doing that, <laughs> right? We're going, to, we're going to be more responsible and more responsive and we're going to talk to people and we're going to ask folks in the community, what does it look like to keep this work? What does it look like to be entrusted with these lives? What do they what do they want from us in this entrusting um, in this process um, and be honest about that. Yeah. Well, uh, it looks like we're coming up on three o'clock and uh, uh, Julian, did you have any last words. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Julian. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure wants to share that. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciate your talk. And again, happy birthday. And I happy birthday, want to yes. thank uh, Eric, who I do see is still still online with us. Uh, yeah, this was you. a <laughs> fantastic day one. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. I have been asked to um, promote something that Julian is involved with, uh, an exhibit at the Hurston Museum, a past unremembered. And uh, the sound, the uh, the the uh, SoundCloud uh, playlist 
is also the sonic, the sonic imagination uh, component of that exhibit. So I've been asked to tell to invite you. I know you can't come from Denmark to do this, uh, <laughs> and and probably not from Texas either. But if you find yourself in Eatonville, please stop by the Hurston. And those of you uh, who are watching, who are in our part of the world, please stop by. It's a fantastic exhibit. In fact, it's so good that I worked, I arranged with Julian to make a, a new version of it for display at the University of Central Florida in the lobby at the library. And we have 65,000 students, some percentage of whom are still going to campus, but it, it's going to be up on the walls. So the posters are over there. I can see them from here. They're going up on the 1st of February. And uh, it's a great, great exhibit. Julian, do you have anything you want to say? It's Philip Cunningham, your colleague. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate that, Scott. Um, a past on Remember, of course, is uh, the exhibit that we, we created for last year with Philip Lamar Cunningham at Wake Forest. That was an exploration of the literary, forgotten literary past of Afrofuturism. Uh, this year, uh, I worked with Clarissa West White and created a Afrofuturist playlist that uh, brings together, uh, again, perhaps not in its totality, but hopefully uh, those representative artists that can get you started on that journey in terms of thinking about the sonic uh, landscape around Afrofuturism. So uh, that playlist is something that you can find uh, when you go to the Zoya Hurston website. Uh, of course, this first day was an opportunity for us to try to navigate the, the complicated landscape of the pandemic. Uh, and normally we would, we would have had lots of different panels, but instead uh, we've gone with high quality as opposed to uh, simple quantity, not that quantity is bad, uh, but two great scholars were able to offer us a glimpse into this little sonic imagination, uh, the very complicated sound of Afrofuturism. I really appreciate that. And tomorrow, I uh, have no doubt we'll have just as compelling uh, uh, presentation. So hopefully our two speakers today will be able to join us. Hopefully for all of you that have watched, this has been helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. I look forward to tomorrow and I appreciate all the folks in Florida uh, making it all happen. I wanna invite you all to come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow for the panel discussion. And uh, it's gonna be great. Um, as Julian says, a great lineup. Um, so please join us back here and um, thank you all for a great day. I'm gonna leave the applause here. Thank you. <laughs>